Hey there, welcome to Authentically Raw. I'm your host, Jamie Darris. Hey there, welcome to the Authentically Raw podcast. Today I am celebrating something special. It is the one year anniversary of the first launch of Authentically Raw. And it was actually January 23rd. I had meant to have this episode out on the 23rd and life happened. So I decided it is just a January 2024 celebration of the one year birth, whatever you want to call it, of this podcast. And what I did is I went back and I checked out the most listened to episode and it is episode 52 on the four attachment styles, which are secure attachment, anxious attachment, avoidant attachment, and then the anxious avoidant attachment, which is often called disorganized attachment. So I thought I would spend some time because one, I'm fascinated with this stuff and I've read some books on it, but I just wanted to go through and kind of throw all of my research together and bring you an episode based on these attachment styles because obviously it's very popular and people are interested in it and there's so much to do and I think that I could probably from these attachment styles do actual in um, you know whole podcast on each one <laughs> because they are so in depth the amazing thing about these is that once you understand your attachment style you can change it. You can become securely attached if you are the anxious, the avoidant, or the disorganized. So that is one thing. And I don't want to leave this other thing out in celebration for the one year anniversary. If you head over to jamiebarris.com, click on the freebies tab at the top, go ahead, throw your email in there, and automatically a free ebook will be sent to your inbox. There is 30-ish days of daily journal prompts with um, some coaching questions to help you develop a better relationship with yourself. There are also self-assessments in there, mind, body, spirit assessments, relationship assessments, a little spot for your successes and goals. There's a bucket list, a brain dump, uh, some things on how to create healthy boundaries. I covered a little bit of everything in here. I think it totals, I don't know, slightly over 50 some pages, but it's a free ebook. I would love for you to download it, print it, and tell other people. Go ahead and share this. Tell them to go over to the website and they can get their free copy too. That's one thing. And then the second thing is, yes, right around Christmas, I published a planner slash journal with all the things that are in the little free ebook, but it's a very big extended version that will last you six months worth. And you can write in the book. It's got an hourly schedule, has top priorities, people to connect with, um, some self-reflection. It, it's got a little bit of everything in there. It's totally something I put together that has helped me and I am using my own thing and I love it and I want to share it with you. So if you want a copy or a copy for all of your friends, I'm sure you do, please head over to Amazon. It is called Results. It's basically Daily Planner um, Self-Development. Just look it up with that title and my name. And if you have already purchased a copy and are loving it, I would love for you to leave a review. It's like pulling teeth getting people to leave reviews. I know because I've been in that boat a million times, but now that I have things out there that really truly depend on reviews for you to be visible and seen and just get your message out there and connect and have community with other people, reviews are huge. And so I'm just gonna ask, please, will you please go leave a review? I really truly would appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. And if you want to send me a screenshot of, re- of your review, email it to me at jamie at jamiebarris.com or DM me on Instagram, whichever way, I'll give you a free coaching session. I love doing it. I love what I do. So, hey. But anyway, back to the whole, um, the four attachment styles, our podcast for today. We are going to basically start out, just want to, a real quick, you know, understanding the fundamentals of attachment styles is 
being aware, you know, of which type of attachment style that you are. So you can first become more secure in the relationship you have with yourself, which helps you have rela- um, real secure and healthy relationships with others. So if you look at your relationships, they're not so healthy. Um, you know, what can you do first to become secure in your relationship with yourself? Because it will help you to be attracted and in relationships with other secure people. And those people that are not in their secure attachment style, you'll know how to handle it because you'll understand where they're coming from. You're not going to react to it. You can respond to it. And everybody gets along a lot better that way. Just a couple of fun facts before I dive into each four of the attachment styles is that number one, you're not born with an attachment style. It evolves in childhood through your conditioning, which isn't something that we just go through and then we'd be mad about if you're not where you want to be and you blame everybody else, your caregivers, your parents, your daycare providers, teachers, like whoever. That's not what this is about. What is so amazing is that since you're not born with this attachment style, it's fabulous news because we can recondition ourselves. We can heal from it. Whatever attachment style we are, if we, if we are not secure, if we're anxious, avoidant, or the disorganized, we can heal ourselves. And we can move towards a secure attachment style. It just takes a little bit of work on our part, which, you know, I think we're all worth doing work on ourselves at all times of day. And basically, remember this. Neuroscience has proven that every single decision we make is based on and directed by our emotions. So keep that in mind. And your attachment style is driven by your emotions. So... <laughs> Learning and being aware of your emotions, which is like your emotional intelligence, your EQ, it's often referred to, but being aware of your emotions, regulating your emotions and managing those emotions and then outwardly expressing our emotions in a healthy way is based on a healthy self-love and a secure attachment with ourselves. When we don't have an emotional intelligence, we react, we don't respond and We react based on our deeply rooted insecurities, our wounds, our unmet needs from childhood, and we operate from a fear-based place inside of us as a coping strategy. Whereas when we have emotional intelligence, we're aware, and it comes from a place of being able to meet our own needs, be aware of our emotions, and know what to do with them, and then being Not having that emotional intelligence is all, you know, it's the difference I think a lot. If you want to sum it up, this really helps me to remember. Emotional intelligence comes from a place of self-love, security, and trust. And not having that emotional intelligence, which you you can get more of. You're, You're smart. I promise you, smarty pants. You can do it. But it's coming from a place of insecurity. It's coming from a place of fear and just that wounded, basically, inner child, which everybody is like, oh, you know, I'm a grown up and I'm an adult and I want to go back, that inner child stuff, but this is where it's all rooted from. But the good news is, is we can change it. We can all become secure by developing our emotional intelligence. So it does take work on our part. And again, it's all based on all of these attachments are based on our core wounds, whether, you know, how deeply they are in us, whatever unmet needs we had and boundaries and trusting and all of that. So first, we'll get started with the secure attachment because this is ultimately where we all want to be to thrive in this world. So if the people who raised us could be our parents, it could be step parents, grandparents, siblings, aunts, uncles, foster parents, doesn't matter, whoever raised you, if they were able to manage regulate and express their emotions in a healthy way with clear and loving boundaries and displayed a healthy self-love, self-trust, self-worth, and they modeled authentic living, then we as kids learned through our parenting to be securely attached to ourselves, which in turn allows us to be drawn toward other people who are securely attached. So, If our parents displayed emotional maturity, and even if you're a parent listening, if you display emotional maturity and intelligence, and as parents, you're responsible for themselves and to your children by modeling and teaching, and therefore 
you know, like being responsible by modeling how to manage your emotions, regulate, calm down, and express them in a healthy, loving way instead of, you know, flying under the, off the handle or going into passive aggressive, you know, silent treatments or withholding love, you know, things like that. If parents are able to regulate themselves and freely express their emotions, they teach their kids that. They're being responsible for themselves. And that teaches kids to feel secure just being themselves and also expressing their emotions. And securely attached people feel that they are worthy and deserving of love. They don't seek external reassurance and validation through their partners. So as we grow, we, we have a healthy self-love because that's what was modeled to us. And so we don't try to prove our worth or, you know, earn love through people pleasing or codependency or things like that because we are already assured and we validate ourselves and not through other people. Secure people also trust themselves and navigate their way through their relationships based on a healthy self-love and secure relationship within themselves. It's that self-assurance and the relationship to self that allows them to form a deep emotional connection with their partners without jealousy, without the fear of abandonment or rejection, like fueling their actions. Because whenever we act out of, you know, say jealousy or we're so worried about our partners, you know, losing someone um, like through abandonment or being rejected by them, we're actually acting from our fears and our wounds and not from a place of true love. So secure people, they feel comfortable communicating and expressing their emotions and needs and being vulnerable with their partners. They're responsible for themselves and to each other. So there's the two big words there, for themselves and to each other. How do they do this? (laughs) It's by managing their own emotions and problems. That's how they're being responsible for themselves. And they do this without holding their partners responsible for like resolving, you know, other, the other person's internal and external issues. And those with secure attachments, they give and receive support from one another without swooping in to fix and rescue and save each other in a relationship. And they are being responsible to their partners that way by being there to support. They're not going to jump in and fix and, you know, manage their emotions for them and try to keep the peace or do whatever coddle or whatever they need to do because that is their partner's responsibility and this is how they are responsible to them. But people with secure attachments generally have a high self-esteem. They're in equilibrium within themselves. They are grounded and centered and therefore they are attracted to relationships where they are equals with their partners and they can both stand together on a solid foundation. You don't have one that's like higher than the other. There's no power struggles for control and manipulation and there's not like the domineering one and the submissive one. They're, you know, they're equal. They, it's not like I call the shots and you do what I say sort of relationships. Doesn't mean that they have perfect relationships. Just because you're securely attached to yourself and you're saying secure, securely attached relationships doesn't mean they're perfect. Does mean that they do fight and they should because if there's never conflict in a relationship, that's a that's not a good thing either. But what it means is that they feel safe confronting one another. They feel safe disagreeing. They feel safe about speaking up about hard truths, you know, without attacking one another. They can go and say, hey, this is bothering me or I don't like it when this happens or when you said this, this hurt my feelings or, you know, without being scared. If there is that feeling of I don't, I don't dare say this, I don't dare say the truth or how I'm really feeling because of how the other person will react, that could be a sign right there that you are not securely attached or, you know, one of you in the relationship isn't or maybe both because it should be that you are safe and secure within yourself. Therefore, you feel safe being able to trust other people and problem solve together. And that is huge in securely attached um, individuals in relationships is that they do problem solve effectively. They're highly resilient and self-aware individuals and they do manage conflict effectively. It doesn't mean that they avoid conflict or never have conflict, but they approach it 
and they work through it effectively without being accusatory and making it into bigger problems than it has to be. So I, I kind of created a little bullet list of just different signs of secure attachment. So I'll go through, hopefully I'm not repeating everything I just said, um, but the biggest signs, so it's kind of a recap maybe. And hopefully you see these in yourself. If not, no fear. Like I said, we can all get here. And the first biggest thing is that secure attachment, if that is you, you can regulate, manage, and express emotions in a healthy way, especially anxiety. You don't carry a boatload of anxiety around. Uh, They trust themselves and others. They're responsible for themselves and allow others to be responsible for themselves. They're very good at supporting others without taking on other people's problems and emotions, you know, as their own to fix or manage or cover up or do whatever with. We allow each other (laughs) to be responsible. They are very good at seeking emotional support without expecting to be rescued or saved. They're comfortable being alone. Secure people have high self-esteem. They feel internally safe and secure. They're emotionally available, meaning they can be vulnerable and they can say, hey, you know, this is how I'm feeling right now and here's what I need or here's how I would like to be supported. They feel confident doing that and they're just available emotionally for themselves and to others to, again, support, not rescue. Um, Again, they can manage conflict well. They don't avoid it. They don't ignite it or allow it to consume them. It's just, there's conflict, let's deal with it, and let's move on in a better place. They are comfortable in close relationships. They don't get fearful, um, and they can self-reflect in their partnerships, and then they respond a lot wiser. Instead of reacting out of fears, they slow down and can respond after they've collected themselves checked in, how am I feeling, what am I thinking, and so that things aren't just impulsively, you know, reactive all the time. And they also do have good and open communication with their partners. And securely attached individuals connect easily with others, and they really do tend to have deep and meaningful connections, which is a fabulous thing, because I think that's what we're all searching for, at least that's what I am. The second attachment style we're going to talk about is anxious So I don't want to dishearten you, but actually the next three attachment styles, um, there's anxiety present in all of them. And with the anxious attachment style, individuals have a fear of rejection and abandonment, and then they depend on their partners to fill those voids inside of them through validation, approval, and emotional regulation. And a lot of times what happens with um, an anxious attachment style is that it is, not to get too deep here, but it's um, we're operating from our subconscious mind. Like our subconscious mind is really confused and it combines like say approval with survival and rejection, you know, is a threat to their survival. And so is abandonment, like it's being thrown, thrown out of the pack um, you know, because that was survival back in the day. You, you're you thrown out of the village and you're three years old and you're probably going to get eaten alive, right? So our subconscious mind doesn't understand the difference. And again, this all comes back from childhood. I'm going to go a little bit backwards this time and I'm first going to describe some of the characteristics with the anxious attachment style. And a lot of times uh, it is characteristics, but also in my research, I found they call these also core wounds. So it's kind of characteristics and core wounds. And again, it's an intense fear of rejection, fear of abandonment, high levels of anxiety. They can be clingy. They are the type that like to save, rescue, or fix. I shouldn't say like to. It's, it's ingrained in them uh, to save, re- rescue, and fix others. They need approval from others to feel valued and worthy because they don't feel their own worthiness and value from deep within. And they put other people's needs ahead of their own. And they usually don't even know what their needs are because they're so out of whack with their, you know, with putting everybody else's needs first. And they are highly sensitive to criticism because it is like rejection to them, which could lead to abandonment and 
their subconscious mind is trying to basically save their life, right? But sometimes they can end up feeling engulfed because they feel responsible for people in ways that they are not responsible for them, like managing other people's emotions, you know, solving everybody's problems, doing things for others that they really should be doing for themselves. You know, it's it's say the wife calling her husband's boss to smooth over something, you know, because the husband is just having a hard time at work and blah, blah, blah. And instead of supporting her husband, just listening to him and saying, you know, is there something that I can do for you? And hopefully he doesn't say call my boss because obviously he has not a secure <laughs> attachment if that's going to happen. Um, but it is, you know, not managing our own stuff, kind of jumping over ourselves and managing other people's problems and emotions, trying to fill those unmet needs inside of us and trying to heal our core wounds inside of us, but it doesn't work that way. Um, And anxious people, they tend to be people pleasers. They tend to be codependence, which codependency, I think a lot of people put that back to say alcohol abuse or things like that. This isn't the type of codependency we're talking about. It is more or less you should be responsible for solving, you know, my emotions and uh, even problems. And basically I should be responsible you know, for solving yours. Like no one is responsible for themselves. I'll solve your stuff, you solve mine, and it's just basically a, it's a mess. And that's codependency. But also anxious attachment styles, they can be very jealous, um, but often feel really unworthy deep down and undeserving of love. And so they do things to earn it. They overgive, they overdo, they overaccommodate for people, they constantly say yes. Um, you know, they end up just overfunctioning and really wear themselves out because they have little trust in themselves and they have little or they have difficulty trusting others. And so they try to earn earn it through other people. And so by doing all of this, um, I refer to it as a self, self-abandoning. You kind of self-abandon from who you are and you get completely disconnected from yourself and then you wrap your whole identity up in others by doing for them and earning and proving to the point you don't even know who you are anymore. And when you hear people say, I just feel so lost, I feel so lost, that is a big sign. Or if you feel lost, that's a big sign that you have kind of self-abandoned from your own needs and you're disconnected from yourself because your identity is really wrapped up in other people and their needs. So basically, you are deprioritizing yourself. (laughs) And your love language, believe it or not, is usually like a physical touch. You really, really like people close. It's really high on your list and you don't like to be alone and you're terrified of losing people. But as children, what it boils down to is you didn't really ever learn to self-soothe consistently. So you rely on other people to regulate their nervous system and their emotions. And the anxious, they really tend to need a lot of validation and reassurance from other people. And it's very hard for them to validate themselves. And they're always seeking that constant reassurance from other people, especially their partners. They are usually very, very thoughtful and kind people to the point they focus way more on other people than they ever do on themselves, which ends up being really self-destructive though. It just makes you even more of an anxious type and increases your anxiety and increases your insecurity. Um, These people are generally really very loving and supportive. They truly go out of their way to think about the people in their lives. I mean, they have a huge, generous heart, but so much of what they do um, in the anxious attachment style is really based on fear and core wounds from childhood and the unmet needs from childhood. But they get so focused on other people and they disconnect from their most important relationship and it's a relationship they have with themselves. And they really have a hard or no sense of self and you know their identity really truly is wrapped up mostly in their partner and could be other relationships and they constantly just belittle and kind of put themselves at the bottom of their list. And that's just a really unhealthy thing to do to ourselves. So now we're kind of go back, you know, like I said about the homes that we grew up in and how we were raised, doesn't matter by who, 
but let's just say our, you know, our parents were um, inconsistent. That's the biggest sign of anxious attachment, that there was inconsistent parenting and the parents were not attuned to the child's needs. I mean, it could be from anything. It could be maybe an alcoholic parent that one minute they were very doughty and attentive throughout the day by the evening, um, you know, parent is half in the bag and doesn't respond to the child. It could be, um, you know, maybe the parents do give a ton of love and intention, but maybe they work 60 hours a week and the kids' primary caregivers in those early years were daycare and their needs were very inconsistently met. So the child cries at home and is picked up and loved and soothed, right? And is taught how to self-soothe, but then lays there at daycare all day and doesn't get that same sort of attention. And what's planted in our subconscious mind is this inconsistency. And so child is kind of grappling and trying to, you know, what can I do to earn this love? And this is going on in our subconscious mind at a very, very young age. In fact, all of these attachment styles are developed, I forgot to mention this, between zero, obviously infancy, they say even in the womb, by hearing mother's voice, feeling her nervous system, they can hear things going on outside, but up until age seven is the really critical time. Um, But even if um, child grew up, maybe grew up in a house where parents were overwhelmed, anxious, stressed, you know, whether it was just with parenthood, it could have been with work or their relationship in the home or outside of the home, whatever it was, kids pick up on that energy in the home. They pick up on their energy in the kids, the you know, or, or with other kids in the house, the siblings, the parents. And if they weren't taught or, you know, taught to self-soothe and manage their little nervous systems, then they develop this anxious attachment style. And we can often feel very unstable and confused as an adult and a child with their relationships um, with their parents. Still, you know, as an adult or even growing up, like nothing's ever good enough. I don't know what to do. I'm constantly trying to earn this love one minute. um, I receive it. The next minute, you know, I'm doing the same thing and now I'm not receiving it. Like think of the baby crying, you know, I'm crying this time and she's here and she gets me and now she's not and and that sort of thing. And no, I'm not just saying she to pick on moms or <laughs> the mother figure. Um, but you know, I mean, also if one or more of the parents in the house were didn't have a secure attachment, if they were anxious or the avoidant or the disorganized, we'll get to those two, then that was not modeled for the kids. So they had a hard time um you know, if you were in that sort of household, if you weren't modeled that and taught that, then that's not what your conditioning was. And think of it this way. um, I'm sure as if you're, if you're a parent or even as a child, possibly you remember that separation anxiety from your parents. Maybe they were going out on date night and you were left with a babysitter and you were clinging to mom's leg and dad's, you know, trying to grapple at dad or being dropped off at school or uh, daycare or I think even especially preschool, I can remember that with my kids, dropping them off. Um, One thing, big thing about this is never sneak away from your kids. And possibly your parents did this because a lot of times they thought, okay, I'll plop kid down (laughs) or put baby in caregiver's arms and I'll sneak away without saying goodbye. So kids don't understand at that early age that you're, you know, not going to come back. So to just go ahead and soothe the kid, you know, mommy's coming back, daddy will be right back, I'm going to leave you for a while, I'll miss you and whatever, and leaving and walking away, even if child is kind of crying, if you have time to soothe them, even a little bit better, but that is way better than dropping and sneaking away. It forms that inconsistency and kids get very anxious over that. But also same thing with a Enforced like reinforcement in the house. If there was like the positive and negative reinforcement was really inconsistent, say if like the love and attention was given and then withdrawn, um, let's say like if love was kind of withheld from kids, say child, or if you're the child, or if you're a parent, they have a child, if kids are naughty or they didn't meet parents' expectations and the way they handled that through their disciplining or punishment or whatever was to withhold love. Um, 
then kids are taught that I'm only lovable when I'm making this person happy or I meet their needs or, you know, it's they're already being taught to regulate the parent figure in their life to regulate their emotions. And it's ingrained in them, in their subconscious mind, that I'm only lovable when I'm good, when I'm pleasing others, when I make them happy. And then that really develops that attachment style that's anxious. Or if parents were very blaming, they blamed their emotions and their problems, like how they reacted was all blamed on their kids. You know, it's, you're so naughty, you made me yell at you for four hours, or I hit you because you just do this all the time. And so basically, they don't have their emotions in check, and so they will tell their kids, it's all your fault, I'm acting like this, and I can't get it together. Um, that definitely will form anxious attachments. And obviously, if this is the type of household that you were raised in, that means that parents or caregivers lacked that emotional intelligence. Because remember that emotion, emotional intelligence is first you know, being aware of how you feel inside managing those emotions, you know, taking a breath, regulate, and then we express them appropriately. We express them with love. You know, I'm feeling pretty angry right now because this happened and, you know, we're teaching in a, in an intelligent, emotional, intelligent um, place. So being aware and taking time to respond and not react and learning how to self-soothe and regulate your own emotions instead of trying to do it through others. Really, the anxious attachment style, think of it this way, their subconscious slogan is, I should meet all your needs and you should meet mine. No. (laughs) Because the thing is, is they never meet their own. Other people are never allowed to meet their own. And it just, it does not, does not make for a healthy relationship. So how do you be heal and become more secure? You can. Your goal is definitely to be more securely attached to yourself. It all has to start with a relationship to yourself. So the anxious attachment style, you're trying to become securely attached, but you're trying to do it through other people. And it's impossible. And it's really once you develop a secure attachment with yourself that all of your other relations, can, you know, relationships can be healthy because you're operating from a healthy place yourself. And it starts with you really truly have to meet your own needs. You have to be able to manage and regulate your emotions. You can be supported by other people to deal with your emotions and your problems, but we can't rely on other people doing it for us and we can't go and do it for other people either. Uh, The big needs that we really have to overcome in ourselves are really that feeling of self-validation and knowing Knowing your worth, approving of yourself, loving yourself, knowing your value. And a huge one is trust, self-trust, really trusting yourself, knowing that you're enough, having clear and loving loving boundaries um, in, of course, being authentic because we can just completely lose our identity if we are self-abandoning and only meeting the needs of everybody else, um, you know, wrongly thinking it will help us. And you know what, you really do have to give yourself support and courage and be compassionate with yourself and give yourself some love like the, uh, the real anxious attachment style is so used to doing for everybody else. So really some self-empowerment and encouragement really goes a long way and it's a process. It does take some time. So the third attachment style would be avoidant. So Think of it this way. As humans, we are all wired for love and connection. All of us, from birth. Avoidance really truly want to have deep connections, but it's more like in a fantasy-like way because ultimately they are emotionally unavailable and they fear emotional attachment because they were emotionally neglected. So they were raised in houses where their emotional needs were unmet And they learn to adapt to that emotional neglect by turning off their emotions as a protective mechanism. They were born, you know, just longing for the love and connection like everybody else. But their pain and their shame from the rejection or the abandonment and the neglect that they received by how they were raised was so strong that in their subconscious mind, they decided it was safer to basically not need any emotional connection and they turn that off. 
So what they did is they detached emotionally to protect themselves. It was a survival mechanism. It was a way to cope. Um, and a lot of them, like the characteristics, and I will say again, it's based on some core wounds and, and things too, either way you want to look at it, but some signs is that they're often perfectionists. They fear other people seeing their imperfections because they feel truly that they are defective and they're really ashamed, which fuels their fear of abandonment because deep down they believe, you know, if, if you knew the real me, then you won't like me. So I'm going to protect myself from pain by not being emotionally available. I'm just going to shut those emotions down and be completely, you know, I'm, I'm going to avoid all of that. And they do this because they felt so rejected and neglected as children. And they also have very high levels of anxiety. Um, they also are insecure. And basically, all three of these attachment styles, the anxious, the avoidant, and then the anxious avoidant or disorganized, they are all insecure attachments. Obviously, just the secure is secure. But they uh, are really prone to depression. They are definitely highly sensitive to criticism because to them it is, it's reject again and abandonment. Um, and they, it's a lot of what fuels that perfectionism because they figure if I'm perfect, then I can avoid all of that criticism and shame being thwarted in my way and I'll do anything to protect myself from it. So if I'm perfect, I won't receive any of that. But you know, they obviously avoid and they're often uncomfortable with physical touch or closeness and they have difficult fe difficulty feeling, managing and expressing their emotions because they decided to detach from them. And they often are the ones that accuse everybody else of being too clingy and needy. They obviously kind of pull it opposite in that way of the anxious attachment style, even though they do carry a high level of anxiety as well. And they have difficulty asking for emotional support or flat out just refuse it when it's offered. They, you know, you might hear them say all the time, I'm fine, I'm fine, leave me alone, I'm fine. When they're clearly not. <laughs> but they do often avoid eye contact. They fear that getting too close to people, you know, it, it's just, it's like waiting for the bomb to go off or the next shoe to drop. You know, when will they get hurt? I don't want to get close because I'll end up just getting hurt. So they protect themselves that way. And they can often come across as being really independent, like extremely independent, independent, and they avoid partnerships. And they are almost like how the anxious was a codependent. They're almost like a counterdependent. It's basically their little mantra is, I'm fine being on my own to meet you know my needs. I can meet all my needs and you're on your own to meet your needs. But you know we can get together and hang out sometimes, <laughs> you know, sort of thing. That is not how they want to attach is through you needing them or they needing you. Um, and they do. They become coolly detached and emotionally like driven situations. They're like, I'm out of here. They're the ones that exit the room or change the subject or just completely avoid anything um, emotionally driven or be, you know, people being vulnerable. And nope, they're not going to be vulnerable with you. Um, and they really do disregard like their own struggles and needs. And they do that to, to keep the peace a lot, even in, you know, in situations around them. But they're unfortunately more prone to infidelity and cheating um, because it's easier than real connection. Um, they, they don't really get emotionally involved and they will sometimes lie as a way to preserve their independence. So, but the causes, again, I mean, if you go back to how they were raised, it was from caregivers that did not respond. They could have let the baby cry it out, which it's sad to say, but a lot of parenting, um, I don't even, I'm blanking on a word, you know, different strategies for parenting, you know, things come and go, like, I don't know, necessarily want to call it a fad, but I can even remember when some of my kids were little, it's, you got to let them just cry it out and things like that. Well, that does not teach a child how to soothe their emotions. It doesn't teach them how to trust like themselves, number one, trust that if I cry, I can trust someone to come up and love me and kiss me and soothe me. So there's no trust being built. They feel neglected. They feel rejected and they feel abandoned. They don't understand what you're doing. Um, but it could just be from 
you know, parents possibly that avoided touch or physical contact with babies and kids. And I think that's why the whole skin on skin now when babies are born, they're put right on mom's chest and that skin to skin is really important because it develops a secure attachment and why you should hold your babies a lot and know they're not meant to cry it out. <laughs> you, that's our job is to teach them how to self-soothe and regulate their emotions. So they're not exploding or avoiding, you know, retreating and, and that as they grow up. Um, they could have obviously grown up in a household where it was that fend for yourself type. Um, could have been because parents just were emotionally, you know, detached themselves. Or it could have been that parents were working, traveling, or just they were either physically unavailable or emotionally unavailable. But also um, in the avoidant attachment style, kids can develop it because of a parent's illness. I mean, it could be an adoption, a divorce, a death, anything like that where they felt very disconnected and not secure with a parent figure. But it could also come from parents that are really discouraging, you know, or telling kids don't cry or toughen up um, because you're, you're teaching kids to suppress their emotions and bottle them up inside and disconnect from themselves instead of, you know, kid falls off the bike and gets a skinned knee and parent instead of, oh, brush it off, you're fine, toughen up, you're good, get back on there, you know, and go. We are taught to do that a lot, but really just taking a few minutes holding kid in arms <laughs> and, oh, that looks like it hurts. Let me kiss you. Let me hug you. Pretty soon they're wiggling to get out of your arms and go because you helped them regulate their emotions, release it through some healthy tears. Yes, crying is a healthy way to manage and respond to negative emotions. Doesn't matter if you're seven or 77. And, um, you know, parents that didn't model that or teach that or allow it, often kids can just completely be detached from their emotions and go down the avoidant trail. But also if parents mocked um, their kids and their emotions or say they disregarded them or they acted as if their kids' problems were insignificant, you know, I'm getting bullied at school or so-and-so said this about me and it hurt my feelings, blah, blah, blah. And that's answered with, oh, it's fine. You're overreacting. That's not even a big deal. That sort of thing. Um, you know, it really teaches kids. They don't know how to manage that. It's basically saying, you know, your feelings are unimportant. Get over it and move on. And that teaches them to detach from that emotions when in a secure household, um, it would be you know, just validate. Oh, I understand how that hurt your feelings. Yeah, I bet that made you feel sad. Is there anything you need from me? Oh, you need a hug? Okay, here's a hug. And that's all it really takes. But really, too, <laughs> this is a big one, and it's showing annoyance. And I think this can happen a lot because parents can get impatient. But showing annoyance when a child experiences a problem because there are stressors and anxiety and problems in our world and parents have a lot on their plates, right? But this happens a lot when um, parents also will try to feel the need to deal with a problem for their kids too instead of supporting the child through it by teaching them how to problem solve and manage their emotions and come up with their own solutions, which builds self-trust and confidence in children. Because a lot of times, you know, it's the helicopter, the lawnmower parents, they swoop in and it's, they either have to try to fix the problem or it's a very condescending, shaming way. Well, they said that to you because of this. You should, you know, it's, it's the should thing. Well, you should have done this. Well, you should have said that. This is how you should have reacted. Everything is very reprimanding for whenever they have a problem, whether it was their child's fault or not. And so then they feel that they are always at fault and they never make the right decisions on how to handle things and you know again it kind of goes back to I need to just be perfect and I need to not have emotions and then I won't even have any problems but it does cause a ton of insecurity and that lack of self-trust and it does teach kids to detach and you know become robots avoidance can also tend to be kind of that robotic thing, you know, and they, they really truly avoid emotional connections because it's just too painful and it's too hard to navigate because they never learned how. 
Um, and they really truly believe I'm defective. I'm not enough. I don't belong or I don't, I feel like I always feel like an outsider, you know, in groups and they carry a lot of shame and they're super sensitive to that criticism, but they pretend that they're not and they will, they can fall in love. Yes, they can, but they easily will withdraw or pull away or isolate themselves and they're very afraid of people relying on them. And they're very afraid of relying on others because they, they feel really weak if they have to rely on others. And then they also feel just trapped and helpless and powerless when people get too close. And so they will shut down and go into avoiding people. When actually they yearn to be seen, acknowledged, and appreciated. And they really... They really need that empathy and that compassion from others because it wasn't present in the childhood, even though it's very uncomfortable for them. They, they really, they, they'll receive it, but don't get touchy and feely about it, right? Just be careful how you do it. They respond really, really well to positive reinforcement, just encouragement, you know, compliments, hey, good job, well done, you know, high five or something that you noticed and they really respond poorly, obviously, to negative reinforcement. Most of us do, but especially them. Um, you know, secure people can handle some criticism, <laughs> whereas they cannot. And I think to wrap up the avoidant, if you see that this is signs in you or possibly some of you know or your current partner, uh, they do have the capacity to love. They really, truly do. And they do fall in love, but they really struggle with how to express and receive love in their relationships. So their challenge is going to be staying in love and staying in a relationship. And again, it is all about that self-support in order to move towards the secure attachment. It has to be, you know, stop neglecting their own feelings, tune into their emotions and begin to learn to trust themselves and develop that relationship with yourself to be secure and self-soothe and be compassionate and vulnerable to open up and allow others to support you. And so finally, number four, the anxious avoidant attachment style, which is often referred to as disorganized. So basically, this is like a big combustion of the two. (laughs) And they have the most core wounds and inconsistent behavior because of it. They find it really difficult to trust others because they don't trust themselves at all. They long for and just yearn for connection and love. But because of their abandonment and rejection wounds, the anxious side of them wants the deep connection and will chase after it while their avoidant side wants the connection, but then they feel trapped and suffocated when things get too close in relationships and then they will withdraw. So it's kind of like the yin and the yang. (laughs) Their anxious side will overcompensate by putting everybody else before themselves by overgiving, you know, the overdoing, the overachieving. And then, you know, they get really connected and involved and close with people. And then the pendulum swings the other way. And all of a sudden it's like, boom, They feel engulfed and they feel overwhelmed and completely powerless in relationships. And then they will retreat and pull back because it's it's all just too much. It's like they're super needy and they dive in all head first. And then all of a sudden it's like, wait, whoa, everybody else, you you know, you're too needy. (laughs) So it's kind of like they're needy, but can't stand how needy other people are, right? Deep down, anxious avoidance, they feel very unworthy and like they aren't ever good enough for anyone, especially themselves. And their primary wound is trust. A lot of it does go back to trust issues. And anxious avoidance, they don't trust themselves. So when they do form relationships and invite someone into their world, they naturally want to get close. But when they form that bond, they have a hard time trusting in it, if it's real or not. You know, they, the anxious side comes out and they get clingy and then they don't trust that. And then they retreat. And the fear is that they just, they're not safe. They're not safe to open up and show other people the real them. And they fear any type of betrayal, infidelity, lying. They're very hyper aware of that. They don't trust that they can depend on other people, like their partners, um, to be there for them when they need them. And they often don't trust like their environments around them or the outcomes of situations They tend to be really controlling because they're just, it's like that pendulum, that yin and that yang, back and forth, black and white. Um, 
but they really, they, they control, they try to keep the peace, they avoid conflict like the plague, um, you know, whatever they can do to avoid chaos, they will. And again, their big characteristics and core wounds, you know, it leads them into being very hypervigilant. They notice everything from someone's tone of voice, their mannerisms, the energy in the room, you know, the smallest shift in someone's behave, behavior, they are constantly reading people, constantly reading the room because they're trying to adapt and control and keep the peace between everyone around them and in the environment. Um, and it makes them really intense, a very intense personality. They're highly, like, I know a lot of people, you know what I mean? When you know those highly, really intense people, they're kind of spicy, right? Got a lot of fire in them. But also means that they are usually very highly ambitious. They can be high achievers. They put a lot of pressure on themselves to achieve and prove their worthiness. They put so much on their plate, <laughs> they can often become really scatterbrained and frozen. And then they avoid everything altogether. So it's like that yin and that yang, right? They, they have all this anxiousness and they put a ton on their plate. I've got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. And then all of a sudden the avoidant comes in and they completely freeze feel powerless and pull back and avoid and just and stop and they're paralyzed but they are definitely this is the disorganized they are definitely great at showing up for everyone else but they are horrible at showing up for themselves especially when the other person is in a crisis they're there they're your person think of the people that they'll drop everything and, and come to you um but they rarely will drop things and come to their own rescue. So there's a difference there of people that will drop things and help other people out, but then they also help themselves out. The disorganized, they do not. And they completely lose their relationships with themselves. They, they do feel lost, completely disconnected. Um, they are self-abandoning for sure. And they pay way more attention though to the whole outside world and everyone else than they do for caring for their own needs. And they really often become kind of disassociated, um, a little spacey or in their own world because they just, they kind of check out. There's so much going on in there and so much, you know, to manage. Um, and a lot of times they end up feeling really lonely or alone in the world because um, they are so disconnected from themselves. And they feel this way even if they're rarely alone. It doesn't have anything to do with whether people are around or proximity. It's more of a a deep loneliness inside. And a pitfall is they rarely speak up for their needs and they expect others to know their needs and they can get pretty angry. <laughs> but it's because they're so hyper vigilant, they know what everybody else needs. They they're always reading the room and they're very intuitive to other people and they jump on it and they, you know, they get what everybody needs and they're to their rescue and they get really frustrated that no one can seem to know what their needs are because it makes them feel like, hey, no one cares about me. No one understands what my needs are, even though I don't tell them, you know, they should just know. When in reality, they usually don't even know what their needs are, even if they're asked. So yes, they'll find that like they get, they get mad because other people aren't reading their mind because they kind of are reading everybody else's mind and behaviors and mannerisms and emotions and all that all the time. But the anxious avoidance or disorganized, they really battle everything up inside. They really battle up their emotions for, they just suppress, suppress, suppress and, and battle it up. Usually to the point, they're the ones that come very volcanic. Like they just hold everything in and then they explode and they can really be harsh with their words because they've just held it in for so long and they just they don't know how to regulate they don't know how to manage um, because they're just so used to express suppressing everything it just starts just leaking out in not a good way and when we go back to where how they were raised so they were mostly raised um, by parents or caregivers their household had usually a lot of trauma could have been physical abuse sexual abuse violence um, emotional or a mental abuse could have been a death some sort of a trauma like divorce children of alcoholic parents or drug addictions children in the foster care system maybe they went through natural disasters or tragic incidents hey maybe these children <laughs> went through a pandemic i mean it is something to be 
very aware of as parents, if you have children, that that is trauma. It's trauma for all of us. But how did we handle it in our household? Because our kids were totally absorbing that. Um, because as parents, we are a source of comfort or a source of fear or comfort. And you have to keep that in mind as a parent. But again, with your childhood, I mean, think about it in your house. Were, were your caregivers a source of comfort or a source of fear? Um, and if you are the disorganized, usually your parents swung from one to the next and you never knew who you were going to get. They were very, so you were so hyper vigilant. You tiptoed around and walked on eggshells because some days they were comforting and loving and soothing. And then the other days, you know, you were scared of them, um, because you had no idea what you were going to get or how they were going to react to, to you. And sometimes, or a lot of times, there was fear was used in the household to get children to comply instead of like a positive reinforcement. You know, it was the you do this or else instead of, you know, good job for doing this. And, um, you know, there was always like a punishment tied to getting kids, you know, if kids didn't do things. Or there was like a withdrawal of love. So everything was very negatively reinforced. Even to try to get positive re, um, behavior to come out. There wasn't that positive reinforcement. Pushing kids along. Wanting to guide them. Instead there was possibly narcissistic parenting. It was a very chaotic environment. Very irregular schedules. Which could have been from divorce. Or maybe they moved around a lot. Um, there could have just been a lot of stress in the home and it's felt by children. Even if it's not spoken, it's felt. And these kids never knew what they were going to get, let's say, with their parents. Um, you know, maybe it was an alcoholic parent. It was party time one minute, you know, fight time the next. Um, maybe they were passed out, checked out, who knows? It was very chaotic. And kids just never learned how to trust their environment or the people in it. And it was confusing for them. If an anxious avoidant is in a relationship with an avoidant, they will lean into their anxious tendencies and vice versa. If they get in a relationship with an anxious, they will lean into their avoidant. Luckily, if they happen to get in a relationship with someone that is securely attached, they can begin to heal and become more secure. But it does take work on their part to really develop that relationship with themselves and heal their core wounds, all three of them. But it is definitely a possibility. So a quick recap, because I have went way longer than I ever thought I would. But common threads amongst all three, remember this. They are all very full of anxiety. It's at the core of all the three insecure attachments. And they are all very insecure. They all have a fear of loss and abandonment. And they use their attachment style as a protective mechanism to keep them, sa keep them safe. And they're, they fear emotional intimacy even though they all really deep down do crave it we all need it and like I said they are all insecure it never has you being yourself because you're just too afraid and you have the scarce like scarcity mentality it's like scarcity of love and you are operating externally all the time not from within all three are looking for that outside validation and they're in essence, all kind of codependence, even even the avoidant. Um, and really that codependency, again, is basically saying, I need you to take care of my emotional state. I will take care of your emotional state, but neither one of us will take care of our own emotional state. And then the avoidance obviously will lead more to that counterdependent in a way that they want no part of any emotional state with themselves or with you. And they can... All three of these uh, insecure attachment styles can really struggle with imposter syndrome, but we all can start to move towards secure, even if we have, you know, we're basically secure and we, we see a little bit of these characteristics in the, you know, inside of us because no parents have met all their kids' needs. It's impossible. None of us are perfect parents. None of us grew up raised by per perfect parents or caregivers whatsoever, so we all have Unmet, me, unmet needs and we all have core wounds. So what do we do? We can really start flexing our emotional intelligence muscle. And it all starts with becoming self-aware. Be self-aware of your insecurities and your fears and then your behavioral patterns, which I listed a ton. Where do you see yourself? 
You know, are you aware of your emotions and how you react from your emotions? Do you respond? And, you know, specifically really learning how to regulate your emotions. And it's okay. In fact, it's really, really healthy to feel all the feels in life. It's telling us something. And when we respond to our feelings, then, you know, we're communicating with ourselves and we learn to trust ourselves and be more confident and secure because our emotions are really important. They're messages to us. That's basically what they are. They're little messengers. And when we don't respond appropriately, we fall into these insecure attachment styles. And when we're in tune with our emotions, we can address them in healthy ways. We can use them to help ourselves and not hurt ourselves. So if you're stuck in the anxious or the avoidant or you know the combustion of the disorganized um, you know, you're hurting yourself and you are also hurting others too. You're hurting your partner, your friends, your kids, your coworkers, you know, anyone else you have a relationship with because you're either chasing um, something or avoiding something and it's, it's, it's based on fear and not love. Um, securely attached people, everything comes from a place of love and not fear and yeah, it does require developing that self-love and that relationship with yourself. It's believing you're worthy and you're valuable and you are enough and developing that strong sense of security inside. And like I said, the trust and confidence and not seeking it outside yourself. And it does take those, those check-ins with your body, you know, recognize how you feel and it is setting boundaries and you definitely know when your boundaries are violated but the thing is, do you speak up for yourself? Do you place boundaries out there or are your boundaries weaky and leaky and you just, you know, let anything go? So you really have to be authentic and set some boundaries and get centered and balanced and find that equilibrium within yourself. And then you will enter into these relationships with an equal partner. Um, you know, we, we cannot put everybody else's goals and needs ahead of our own. And we have to not act like our goals and needs are above everybody's, but there's this more, we're equals. And that is what is really hard for especially the anxious avoidant, the disorganized. Um, You know, we can't ignore ourselves and put other people on a pedestal. And we have to consider ourselves as equals. And we have to heal the feelings that we're feeling inside and and really work on that. And like I said in the beginning, the fantastic news is that we can all become securely attached. It does take effort on our part. And I will be doing a second uh, podcast on some ways that we can do that. How do we start to build this secure relationship with ourself? Um, one of the big things, I'll give you a hint, is we need... To, we need evidence. We we need to prove to ourselves that we are worthy and we are lovable and we're safe and we're worth trusting and we're confident. And we need to show ourselves this to try to really change this thinking in our subconscious mind that believes otherwise. So I have went on way longer than I ever thought possible, but obviously I I love these attachment styles. I've learned so much and I'm still learning and it's been really fun to incorporate this into my coaching and especially use it on myself and in my own relationships. So hey, I hope that you enjoyed them. And as always, I'm rooting for you. Be real, be raw, be authentic. Thank you so much for listening to Authentically Raw. I'd love to hear from you. Shoot me an email, jamie at jamiebarris.com and let me know what episodes resonate with you and why. Are you a people pleaser? If so, I need your help. Please, I'm writing a book about people pleasing titled The People Pleaser's Guide to Pissing People Off to improve your relationships, especially the one you have with yourself. And I'm looking for personal stories of how people pleasing has impacted your life or suck the life out of you. Maybe people pleasing has held you back, caused you to feel resent, regret, anger, powerlessness, or just plain exhaustion. Let me know how it's impacted your life. Who knows, maybe your story will inspire my writing and grace the pages in some shape or form in this handy dandy little guide. Also, if you enjoy the authentically raw content, please support the show by following and leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. Simply scroll down through the episodes and you will see where to do so. Want to learn more about life coaching? 
head over to my website, jamiebarris.com and check it out. You can also follow me on social media at Jamie Barris for lots of inspiration and empowerment. One last thing, I'm rooting for you. Be real, be raw, be authentic.